Hi everybody, welcome to this special 10% true broadcast commemorating the 34th anniversary of the so-called Raid on Libya, a retaliatory but limited strike on key targets in Libya, designed to show the then leader of Libya, Colonel Gaddafi, that President Reagan would not put up with state-sponsored terrorism. The raid was a multi-service affair that involved air and sea elements provided by the US Air Force and the US Navy. This short episode of 10% True focuses on the experiences of one of the Air Force pilots who took part in the raid, and it's not intended to be a documentary of any description. Rather, it's intended to provide an extremely rare first-hand retelling of the raid, spoken by somebody who was there. This is rare. It may even be the first time that the story has been broadcast using the voice of one of the Air Force participants, because all of the Air Force participants decided to remain anonymous following the event. They may have told friends and family, but they've never gone public. The man I interviewed was the pilot of F-111F callsign Puffy12. He told me that I could reveal his identity if I wished. However, I've chosen not to. The act of going public must be his to take, and not mine. The Air Force portion of the raid, which launched from four Royal Air Force stations in the UK on the 14th of April 1986, was called Operation Eldorado Canyon. The first bombs were dropped at 0200 hours Libyan time, on the 15th of April, and the mission became, at that time, the longest combat mission in history. El Dorado Canyon involved F-111F precision bombers from the 48th Tactical Fighter Wing at RAF Lakenheath, EF-111A Raven tactical jamming aircraft from the 20th Tactical Fighter Wing at RAF Upper Hayford, and KC-10 and KC-135 refuelers, which launched from RAF Fairford and RAF Mildenhall. The F-111Fs were to fly against three target sets, while US Navy strike fighters protected against surface-to-air missiles and MiGs. One F-111 failed to return. The two-man crew of Kama 5-2 drowned when their aircraft impacted the water in the Gulf of Sidra. The pilot, Major Fernando Rivas, was repatriated in 1989, but the body of the weapons systems officer, Captain Paul Lawrence, was never found. Fernando was my neighbour and something of a boyhood hero to me. Many times he'd taken me on base to see the 111s, and he was always kind and patient. One day, I hoped to write the definitive book about the raid, to properly honour Fernando and Paul's sacrifice. Until then, rare and all too short glimpses into the raid like that kindly given by Puffy 12 will have to do. I started the interview by asking about his Air Force career prior to the raid. Enjoy. Well, originally, I was planning on going to the Naval Academy. And again, this is back in the early 70s when you know, a lot of people weren't standing in line to do that. Uh, I got out of high school when I was 16, so you have to be 17 to go to the academy. So my uh, representative said, go to college for a year, come back, you know, we'll give you a, an appointment then. So I drove down to Texas to look at Texas A&M, and back then it was a boys' school. And then driving back up. Uh, we happened to go by Baylor, which is where I ended up going because they had girls and I got a scholarship there. And because um, I was thinking if there's one thing dumber than going to a place where you're going to dump on you for four years, it's paying the money to do it. So I uh, ended up there at Baylor and they only had Air Force ROTC. So uh, they offered me a scholarship. Uh, so I took it. Graduated from there in 74. Spent a year as a cop before I went to flight school which was a slice of life. And it's one of the most interesting jobs I ever had. Uh, then went to flight school, uh, got an F-4 out of there. Uh, it was kind of interesting though, you know, back during the Vietnam War, they were pumping a hundred guys through in a class. We had 15. So I went through with uh, a bunch of Kuwaitis, including the Crown Prince of Kuwait was in our flight school class. So that was a little out of the ordinary. But I've got an F-4, uh, went through F-4RTU at McDill, and probably some of the best training I ever had. I was trained by guys that had like 1,000 hours combat time because the war had just started winding down. So they knew whereof they spoke. They went to Seymour Johnson uh, in North Carolina, flew F-4Es, 334 TAC Fighter Squadron. Uh, we had the newest F-4s in the Air Force. I flew one had 17 hours on it. And it had uh, leading edge slats and Tizio, which is a um, TV camera with uh, basically a telescope on it. And what that allowed you to do was if you were in a furball and you were locked onto somebody, whoever was in the in the TV screen 
going like that, you know, spinning was who you were locked onto. So you could shoot a missile in case there were, you know, a bunch of airplanes around. After that, was sent to uh, Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas, to be a uh, instructor pilot. From Reese, I wanted to go back to F fours. Actually, I wanted to fly Thuds, but they were they were on their way out. F one hundred fives, but they were on the way out. So once I expected to go back to F fours, but they sent me the F one elevens instead at uh, Lake and Heath. So went over there. Uh, went through. You went through. It, it was the oddest thing. You would go through an RTU here in the States at Cannon and the 111. Then when you went to England, you went through another one. Because apparently they thought the planes were that much different. I, I didn't think they were, but, you know, me, Jet's Jet, but we had to go through two RTUs. And that was assigned to the uh, 494th Tank Fighter Squadron, Black Panthers. Uh, was flight commander there for a while, then went to Stanaval. And then after I was there for a year, went to weapons school, came back, went back to Stanaval. Um, we did the raid, a couple other things. Then we, uh, I was transferred to uh, McClellan. There's a test and evaluation squadron where we would do operational tests on systems and weapons before it would go. We were the last check before it went to the field. So we'd actually go out there and test stuff and combat conditions and, you know, sign off on it, and then it would go to the field. And then while I was doing that, I figured, man, I've done everything I'm going to do. And uh, all of a sudden, the airlines started hiring. And before this time, if, if you weren't on the airlines by the time you were in your early 20s, you weren't getting on. But they hadn't hired people in so long, they were just, you know, they were dying off in droves. So we had an opportunity to... A lot of us to go to the airlines, and I'd like to do that. This is not entirely, well, it's not at all related to the raid, but you talked about Tizio. Um, I, I've, I've not heard, I mean, I understand what it is, and I've seen it on, you know, on the sort of the port uh, inboard wing route. That's where it's stuck, right. you know, that camera. Yeah. Um, the, the few conversations I've had around it is that people didn't rate it very much. Was it actually useful? From what they designed it for, it was, because it, it – they, you know, if they give you a weapon system that's beyond visual range capable, but they won't let you shoot it because they're afraid you're going to shoot the wrong guy down, even with, you know, IFF um, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, if you're doing intercepts and you flick that bad boy on, you went, yeah, Meg, shoot. The bad thing about it was it had little winglets on it, on the actual uh, head itself, and it affected the turn. I think it was... If you're turning to the left, I think it affected their, your turn rate a little bit because you had to overcome that. It wasn't much, but it, it was still different. We had slats, the slat at ease. So. The distinction you were talking about between Canon and Lake and Heath was what were they flying at Canon A models? Ds. D models. Okay. D models. And that, that was probably the worst model of the bunch. It was just so magic that it just it would break off. And that's why I really didn't want to go to 111s because, man, they, they'd go for months without turning the wheel at Canon. When I, when I was stationed at Lubbock, you know, you'd hear about this, people coming through and stuff. So I really didn't want to go to, a, to the plane. And, um, but when they said I was going to go to England, I went, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And the F model was, was the best of the bunch by far. And just enough magic in it, but not too much. Can, can you expand on that a bit then? So, so the D model was the digital version, wasn't it? Of the one well, the F model was digital too. It had digital... Um, the uh, weapons and the navigation computers were digital. But the D model had like TV screens, you know, like they have now. And it was the first one to have that. It had a moving map on it uh, and it had a couple other things. I mean, it was just, I mean, for its time, you know, we're talking the uh, late 70s, early 80s. This was like magic. But it was just so far ahead of its time, it wasn't, it hadn't reached the point where, you know, you never want to be the first one to, to own a new electronic gadget. You want to give them time to work out the kinks before you get it. And this thing just had too much new stuff in it. F model, they they went back. Your your uh, flight instruments were just like regular flight instruments. Um, had a uh, your weapons and navigation computer were digital, but none of the, the displays weren't. Train falling radar was the same, um, and it had a dynamite INS in it. This thing was just awesome. I mean, it was, it was designed for you to fly over the pole. 
was so accurate that individual parking spots had their Latin longs. It had a gun in it when it first came out, but they took it out and put the PayTac pod in it. That's, that's what it was designed for. PayTac pod is an infrared camera and a laser. And it allows you to find and track your target and then laser the target yourself. You don't need somebody else up there flying around in a circle shooting a laser for you or some grunt down on the ground, you know, shooting at the wrong thing. And uh, it rolls up into the weapons bay. And then when you roll down, it looks like a, the belly turret on a B-17. That's what it looks like. And uh, it's got an infrared camera. And you look around, you find, well, actually, you aim it with the radar. You find the target on the radar. And that aims the uh, PayTac pot head. And then you flick on, uh, roll the pot out, turn the infra infrared on, and find a target. Sometimes it's easy to find, sometimes it's not, because it's just temperature differential is what lets you find it. And then when you find it, you shoot the laser. And that's used for terminal guidance for the for the laser guided bombs that you carry. As, as pilot, you don't see any of this, do you? It's the wizard. It's well, I was an instructor on. pilot and I had to teach. So I used it a lot. But yeah, as a pilot, used, the whistles over, I guess, you know, he's got his head stuck down in the scope doing his pay tax stuff and you're flying. You get commands, do you, as pilot from the pod through the uh, is it elite computing optical site or something like that you've got? You'll get, you get steering from the weapons computer to a bomb release point. Now, and then it depends on where the, the weapons computer is getting its input. Is it getting it from the radar? Is it getting it from the laser? And there was a, a thing called common filter in the system where, and it was put in there, as I understand it, to keep the, the system from running away, like they had a tendency to do. And that it would take a look at how long you've been flying, what type of update you're giving it. Are you doing like a visual update? Are you giving a radar update? Are you shooting a laser? It loved that laser. If you shot the laser, it took all of it. And then depending on that and how much of uh, error it sets from what you put in, it would apply a percentage of the update to the system. Uh, it wouldn't, it would take the least amount it would take would be off the radar. It would take more off the visual because they figured you're, you're probably smart enough to figure out where you are, which that was a gross error on, <laughs> on this part sometimes, but it loved that laser. It figured if you were going to shoot that laser, you knew what you were looking at. Again, not necessarily the case, but that, that's the way the system was set up. From a pilot's point of view, then how different was the F-111 to be... Um, so the operator of, I mean, I'm not just talking about flying, but in terms of tactical employment, how difficult, how different was it to go from the F4 to the 111? It was a completely different world and a completely different mindset. Um, in the F4 world, and the first thing you want to do is get rid of your bombs and go for an air kill. I got in trouble at weapons school on a what they called a uh, defensive air mission in the 111. That's where they would. You go fly low level, they come out in another 111, try to roll in behind you, and you were to see them and uh, defeat the attack and then run away. Well, I did that about four times, and then the fifth time I shot, I turned on the guy and got a shot on him, and it was a commander of the school, and I got, that's the only, only flight I failed. <laughs> and the guy says, well, you know, that's not really what we're trying to get apart. We're trying to treat, treat uh, you know, do uh, mutual support and say, it's a burning flower or three out there. How much more mutual support do you want? But anyway, but the, the thing about the 111 and that you got, that you learned to appreciate was that thing would go like a striped butted monkey. You put those wings back and you put those throttles forward and they're not going to catch you. I mean, we could literally outrun a bullet. Not missiles, but bullets. And we go to red flag and, you know, it was all daytime and you know our our uh, claim to fame is night and crappy weather we used to tell the f-15 guys two o'clock in the morning your mama's house stop us they're not coming down to 200 feet and chase us going to mock and nobody is you had a a windscreen hotline didn't you as a as a caution light so that you could go fast enough to melt the windscreen it's the only plane, and again, I'm, I think I'm remembering this correctly, that did not have a Q limit. It didn't have an airspeed limit. It had a temperature limit. You go so fast, like in 
and we were out there jacking around one day. We had an empty airplane and nothing to do, and it was like between Christmas and New Year, so you guys had taken the rest of the year off, so we couldn't go on any ranges. We didn't have any external stores lo loaded on. So I asked my whistle, how fast have you been on these things? He says, oh, about 1.2. Let's see how fast we get this thing going. So they pointed us, Scottish Mill pointed us out toward Norway and said, let her rip. And there's this thing called the Rutkowski climb profile that is apparently the most efficient way to get the maximum amount of speed in the quickest amount of time. And so we were doing that. And you had five stages of afterburner. And you could tell when you would light off a stage cause your fuel flow to kick up 2,000 pounds an hour. So we were climbing in excess of 10,000 feet per minute. I only had three of the five stages of afterburner and we were on 2.02 and the paint started burning off. And then the light, my extra caution light came on and I looked down at the panel and usually the Air Force puts these you know, long involved uh, labels on these things like stop afterburner or something like this one just lit up and said slow down. Yeah, it was temperature limited. So that, that was climbing at the same time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were going. It was like I say, it'd go like a striped bed monkey. You get that thing down low and get the wings back. It was like a Cadillac. Now, you couldn't outturn the space shuttle, but there's nobody who was going to catch you. And that was our defense is run away. The other thing that we could do if somebody was chasing us at night is the uh, dump mass are in between the burner cans. So if somebody was chasing us at night, we start dumping fuel and light the afterburner and you get this like 40 foot flame out of the back end. It's called torching. And then they're blind. They ain't finding you. And the last uh, defensive maneuver we had is if we were carrying retard bombs, the ones with the chutes on them, if somebody was behind us, we'd pick one of those off. And then it'd come behind us and explode in front of them. And that would usually be enough to make them stop. When you get to Lake Anise, then you go through the checkout in the F 111S. Um, is that, I mean, you, you've already kind of suggested that it was a, a bit of a waste of time having to have. I think it, it's probably more so the getting used to flying in Europe than it was the airplane. Yeah, you took it like an instrument check and a, an emission qualification check, just like you did in the States. But I think the, the main reason they had a, a separate RTU is that, it, man, they, you saw about some Byzantine flying regulations. You know, you go from the UK over to Belgium, over to the Netherlands, over to Germany, you're looking like, you know, four or five different flight rules. So UK was great. I loved UK. You know, don't fly over London, don't fly over to Queen's house. Other than that, go wherever any way you want. There's there's some pretty good video on uh, YouTube of, of 111s flying through the locks in Scotland and oh, down yeah. through Wales. Yeah. Lock runs. You do those all the time we would do is uh, if it was light and there was like an overcast and we would we were bored we'd go up into the uh, lower layer of the clouds and start torching and then the next day you know there'd be like ufo reports all over the country so i was uh, in fact it's on the it's on youtube i did a was part of the milton hall air show in 86 right after the raid and did on a Friday and a Saturday. And the last thing we did was an airfield attack. We'd come in and do like a dive bomb attack. And then I'd pull up, light the burner, you know, disappear. Well, the first day I did it, my left um, burner blew out. So right one's pumping out the burner. And then the left one's just pumping out raw gas. So it hits the fire and explodes. This huge fireball goes down, hits the ground. A buddy of mine that was filming said the crowd just went nuts. I thought it was a bet, and that's, we set the infield on fire. And I'm up there, you know, nose high, wobbling, trying not to crash, and they're going, yeah, it's a great show. So, so the 111, then, the F model, um, good INS, good speed. Oh, great, um, great INS, good speed. Uh, the computers were were reliable for digital. I mean, this, this state of the art back then. I mean, the... The, uh, the first two models that came out had uh, analog computers in them. And these were digital. So, so was the F-111 good? I mean, I know it's a relative question. To be honest with you, I don't understand why they didn't re-engine re them and update the avionics. Because, man, there's nothing to touch it. You know, nothing gets a tornado. But we used to say, you know, half as much, half as far for twice the price. And, you know, it's a capable airplane, too. But the 111, just the airframe, but once they got the bugs worked out of that thing, you know, with the, and they used the same engines the F-15s used, so it wasn't like they had to build anything new. 
and just you know update the avionics because that thing would haul a ton of stuff. You can't you could have load four two thousand pounders on the pylons, and it was like they weren't even there. You know, and you're carrying four Volkswagens out there, mm. and those are many nukes. So, what one of the things that is characteristic of the, of the conversations that you have with guys who flew during the Cold War, who had a nuclear mission, who had a target, they were going to go in and drop something on it. A lot of them would say they weren't. They didn't know what the plan was once they turned around. They didn't know what they were going to come back to. No, you weren't coming back to anything. Right. If you thought you were, you're crazy. Because I, I am firmly convinced, and again, I may be totally wrong about this. I, I, I'm firmly convinced we'd never first strike. Now, we might launch under attack, but we, I, I'm firmly convinced we'd never first strike. And, uh, you know, I had a... What, you know, various and sundry targets, but the worst one, well, I guess the worst one, the longest one was, was the Murmansk run, where you lake and heath up to the, you know, the naval bases up in the Murmansk. Go up there, drop your bomb, you have about 45 seconds worth of gas for an escape maneuver, and then it's up to you. Right it in. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, you weren't coming back from that one. But, you know, if it ever happened, there wasn't anything to come back to. Do you, do you dwell on that? Uh, <laughs> no. You got to understand the fire hog mentality. We're basically like dogs, you know? Do I eat it, mate with it, or kill it? And it was kind of funny. I was, the Lake and Heath had the regional medical center for the Air Force in England. So they had all the specialists there. So they had, there was this new psychiatrist that came to the base and I was drinking with him tomorrow one night. And he says, I don't, I don't get you guys. I go, what? He says, there'll be a hundred of you in a room and they could tell you you're going on a mission and 99 of you aren't going to get come back. And all of you sit around and look at the oh, God, shame all the others. These guys are going to die. Yeah, well, I mean, what do you want? You go when it's your time to go. I mean, there were like five times in my flying career. I thought, yeah, this is it. This is when I'm going to meet Jesus or Odin or the devil, however it, it works out. But uh, and only one, only one time was it my superior flying skill that got me out. The other time was just timing and just pure dumb luck. Give, give us some examples then. It was prior to when we went to uh, Libya, we had been stayed, we'd gone down to Zaragoza in Spain to use that range. And they'd been trying for years to, for the, to let the Spanish let us in there. So we're finally down there, been down there for about a week. And we come back from downtown uh, Saturday night and there's a, like a note on the door saying, back up, we're leaving in the morning. We're going, yeah, right. They're not bringing us back. You know, we thought somebody was just messing with us because it was like written in hand. It wasn't like a, you know, a official word or anything like that. We thought somebody was just messing with us. So we go in, go back to sleep, and they come knocking on the doors. Come on, we're going back to the heat. So we pack up, fly back to Lake and Heath, and we land. They walk as we're coming to the squadrons. They go, okay, everybody can go home except you, 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 and you. And all right. Get, you know, get back in the planes. We're going to Turkey. And we were going to go bomb someplace in, in Lebanon. So we disappear, go do that. So while we're killing time down in Turkey, waiting to go, and we never ended up going for some reason. But um, we were doing, uh, dropping concrete bombs, 2,000 pound concrete bombs with the seeker heads on them. We're training at Konya range in Turkey, which is in the center part of the, the country pretty much. So I'm down there, you know, 200 feet going 650, 700. And I take a turkey buzzard. And they, I mean, these are like 40, 50 pound birds down there, like right in the face. If that had happened six months earlier, I'd have been dead. Because they had just put in new, better bird resistant windscreens. Because usually it would come to take head off. And uh, as it was, this one after we hit and we figured out what it was, it started to crack, it started cracking. <laughs> so we slowed down, dumped the cabin pressure and ambled on back. But you know, like I say, six months earlier, I'd been dead man. And it's just luck of the draw on timing. The only reason. I was in F4s, uh, you know, typical stupid lieutenant. We're in a four ship and I'm on the wing and this, this idiot that's leading us takes us right in a thunderstorm, right in the middle of one. So we're bouncing around and there's hail and there's snow and there's St. Elmo's fire and there's lightning and stuff. You know, I'm just an idiot. I'm, it's kind of fun. And we pop out the other side. 
Week later, happens again to a four ship. Guy comes up, number four guy gets spit out and then comes back up in between three and one and breaks both their wings off. And guy ended up getting killed uh, because of that. And it's, again, exact same situation, just I was lucky and he wasn't. Hmm. The, the 111 then has this capsule, right? Sorry. Yeah, the escape capsule. That, that thing's pretty nifty, except it's hard as hell to bury once you land. That's a... <laughs> I was going to ask you what the plan was if you. Well, we were going to turn it, I don't know if it, we were going to turn it a photo mat, I think, you know, so <laughs> run away. But yeah, I mean, it, we used to say it's good, the best thing about it was give you time to get your story straight on the way down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and apparently, and again, you can verify this, but I don't think it ever failed when it was used within this design envelope. I thought there were a couple where the bags didn't open and guys in that were broken. Well, they did, but they lived. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they showed us a film of it and, you know, how it works. And those are on YouTube too. And I'm glad I saw those because it scared the crap out of me if I hadn't seen that. Because the thing separates a big rocket, does a quarter row to the right, and then it drops straight down. And then it repositions and the bags open on the bottom. You hit. I mean, I'd have been, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was great. You know, you didn't have to wear a parachute or any of that kind of stuff. So and you had all your stuff there. There's a hit and run kit in the back there. So so what was the envelope for it then? Do you remember? I think it was like on the ground at 80 knots. Yeah. And then as fast as it'll go. It wasn't zero zero like Martin Baker's. Then again, not many things are. Uh, are the aces, but for, you know, for as big as that thing was, as much as it weighed, it, it did a good job. What was the first indication you had then that something was going to happen in terms of the wing preparing for, for a mission? The uh, El Dorado Canyon? Well, like I said, we had been deployed before to go strike someplace. And didn't do it. And then we got put on alert again, and we didn't do it. And we got put on alert again, we didn't do it. And actually, the Saturday before the raid, they were we had a they were having a uh, U.S. English neighbor good neighbor deal at the base, uh, big uh, do. And about every five minutes, the wing commander would get up and leave, and they'd come back. And then turn fifteen minutes later, he'd leave again, and then come back. And then when I got home, got a call that says, don't go anywhere this weekend. Okay, whatever. And then got a call Sunday afternoon that says, come in. And we were going to have, we were having a, uh, what was called a salty nation, which was a, our pretend war, our training wars that we'd use to get ready for our, our NATO tack of owls where they come in and inspect us. So we had one of those scheduled that week and we figured out, oh, well, this is just part of that. So we come in. And went to 494th, and that was a, the fighter squadron that was farthest away from everything. And we're walking in the door, and again, this is 1986. There's this big, huge satellite antenna on top of the squadron, and wires and stuff coming through the door. And we're walking in, and we look around. And there's guys in, in like civilian clothes sitting there listening to stuff. And what they're doing, they were listening to the Libyan uh, air defense net. So we go in, we sit down, and they start briefing us. And then Chief Staff of the Air Force walks in. Hmm. American Ambassador walks in. The two judge advocate generals, or you know, two lawyers come in and start talking us about the law of armed conflict and how we this is okay that we do this one. Well, we don't care. Ronnie wants to say <laughs> Ronnie says go do it. We'll go do it. You know, we were, we were not given the deep introspective thought. Um, and then they said, uh, this is more briefing. I said, okay, go get something to eat and come back. So me and my whistle, we went over, just, let's go see what's going on at Milton Hall. Cause that's where all the tankers usually go. Is it Milton Hall? And it's just right down the road. So we're driving down there and I think there was every KC-10 in the Air Force except one was sitting there. And you can't hide those things cause those tails stick way up. Well, hmm, man, maybe something's going to happen. So they said, okay, well, go home. They sent us home. I'm surprised they didn't leave us on base, stay on base, but we went home. I said, come back at 2.30, and we'll final brief, and we'll go. And that's what we did. 
And then we came back, and I still was expecting them to cancel it, because I always did. And I think the thing, when it finally hit us that it was going to go, we were walking out the uh, squadron building, and they gave us real bullets for our guns, because they never did that. So, well, now I guess we're going. Did you did you have any input? So you, as a weapons school grad, I would have expected they would have brought you into the planning process. Zero. None. And if I had, it, uh, and again, I... I'm not going to second guess this stuff. Somebody's got to make decisions and somebody's got to decide what's what. And um, it, it did kind of irritate us a little bit. It's like somebody said, they send you to school, but they won't let you read. They trained us to plan things like this. Mm. And it was the most unreal plan I've ever seen in my life. You're going to send six guys, one after another, same IP, same target, same axis of attack, you know, a minute apart. I mean, you don't have to be a hero or Soviet Union to sit there and go, well, there goes one. There goes two. Oh, maybe there's another one coming. Uh, 59, just tick, 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 tick. And I think that's probably what happened to Fernando and, and Paul. Is it just, they finally got the timing down when they came through. Was, was, can, you, can you talk a sort of big picture about them? Because there were three 111 streams, weren't they? Yeah, we went down. The one I was in, we went to the airport. Uh, Paul and Fernando's bunch went to his house. Uh, and the third bunch went to the terrorist training camp, which we also call the sports center. It was basically, it's a sports center, and that's where they supposedly train in their frog men. And the deal was we were not going down there to kill him. If we got him, hey. Eh. So much the better, but the purpose of the flight was not to kill him. The purpose of the flight was to leave visible physical damage. And they were probably most restrictive ROE I've seen ever. If you couldn't visually identify, if you couldn't identify a target and are absolutely certain what you were dropping on, you don't drop. If everything is not working on your plane, you don't go. Because it wasn't really, it really wasn't, it, it, down there to really pound them. We asked them, so why don't we go down to the uh, oil field? A little crap out of them. There's nothing down there. Yeah, there's a lot of money invested down there. We, <laughs> you know, okay, fine, whatever. Did you did you have any input? So you, as a weapon school grad, I would have expected they would have brought you into the planning process. Zero, none. I'm not going to second guess this stuff. Somebody's got to make decisions, and somebody's got to decide what's what and um, it, it did kind of irritate us a little bit. It's like somebody said, they send you to school, but they won't let you read. They trained us to plan things like this. And it was the most unreal plan I've ever seen in my life. You're going to send six guys, one after another, same IP, same target, same axis of attack, you know, a minute apart. I mean, you don't have to be a hero or Soviet Union to sit there and go, well, there goes one, there goes two. Oh, maybe there's another one coming. Uh, 59, just tick, 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 tick. And I think that's probably what happened to Fernando and, and Paul, is it just, they finally got the timing down when they came through. Was there a mass briefing? Did you then break out? Yeah, we had a mass briefing. And then uh, we came back the next day there's another mass briefing and basically talk about takeoff, how we were going to rendezvous with the tankers, uh, how we we're going to leave you in and meet up with the spark marks, the EFs, and then how we were going to get down there, how we were going to get back on the tanker after the attack and how we were going to get back. Then we broke up into our sections, you know, the, you was going to the airport or going to the house or going to the pool. You went with them and they talked about their routes of flight stuff. And then you just got together with your whistle and looked at the package they gave you. And if I remember correctly, when we looked at that thing, there was like a 60 mile error on the first leg that we found. Found it and they they corrected it. And we're sitting there going, you know, we plan our own flights all the time. That's what we did. You would come in, you get a target, you look at the defenses, you plan your own flight in, you plan your own flight out, and, and do it yourself. And you can do it, you know, we can do it an hour, hour and a half. Wizzles can pull his, you know, his aim points and stuff. And, and for some reason, they wouldn't do it. 
can you speculate as to why? I think probably the third air force commander or, or the, the you say fear the, uh, the army guy, the army general decided they were going to decide how this thing was done. And by God, that's how we were going to do it. And, you know, we were telling me that why are you running six guys in a row one after the other? First of all, you know, one's going to hit the target, two will probably hit the target. Three's not going to be able to see it. Four's not going to be able to see it because there's going to be smoke and debris and camel guts and stuff up in the air. Five and six probably going to die. Why, why are you doing that? Have, have we learned nothing from linebacker, you know, that you go the same uh, course and altitude and airspeed one right after another? They're, the, the, the guys at the end are dying. And we could have done it a different way without any real problem because that's what we did. And we had plenty of weapons school guys. We had plenty of, of uh, experienced crews there because they handpicked who went. And uh, each, each commander of the, of the targets picked who they wanted to go with them. What um, was the quality of the intelligence then you had around the threats? I mean, how, if you've got these guys listening into the Air Defense Network, it sounds like you, you had a pretty good idea as to what you'd be up against. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I never paid any attention to them. Who the hell knows until you get there? You know, you got have you got the A team on the on the scope down there. You got some guy that's you know drinking the night before and he's all messed up and or he's scared or you don't know until you get down there what it's going to be. You, and I, I was all told by a guy at four training says, you know, when you're fighting somebody, always assume they're John Wayne until he shows you they're Gabby Hayes. Um, you always assume they're good until they show you something different. What about the, I think it's the Venkus book where he talks about a bunch of stuff that happened in the months before the mission where the wing or maybe just components of it were going out and flying long duration sources to see how the airplanes handled in terms of. I think, and again, I may be wrong. I think they used Upper Hayford for those long range missions. Ah, did they? they? I think think so. Again, I may be mistaken on that. But I think they like flew to Canada or something like that. I think it was Hayford, the, the Hayford 111s that did that. But they were E-models and they had the old analog crap. So, you know, that's a long way down there. Hmm. That was the second one in the air and the last one on the ground. I was in there for like 14 and a half hours. So, I mean, we could, have this, we could have flown this mission from the States in the amount of time it took us to get down there and back. Can you explain why the, the extended duration though? They wouldn't let us go across France. France wouldn't let us go down and cross their airspace, and Spain wouldn't either. Although I asked the question, well, why don't we just cross over this French-Spanish border because they don't have any radar cover down there. What are they going to do? And then we get down there. <laughs> the, the, one of the most amazing things about this, uh, okay, we, get, we take off, we join up. That thing, it goes like clockwork. And it's the first time, and I mean, it's the largest aerial mission that left England since World War II. I mean, there were tankers and fighters and jammers all over the place. And somehow we all get together. And as we're turning, headed south, south of London, the EFs come in and roll in right in their space. And as we left lands in, everybody was where they were supposed to be, on course, on time. And you just look around, there are airplanes everywhere. I'm just... It would be curious to see what was going on down at, at Heathrow Approach Control <laughs> about this time. So we head down there, and you know we're going down the, the Atlantic, heading toward Gibraltar, and we start getting further and further behind in time. And the thing was, it says you drop at this time, or you don't drop. And come to find out the reason they were so, and I mean for nukes, it was like plus or minus five minutes. And for conventionals, plus or minus 15 minutes was, was considered on time. And especially when you're not going like 3,000 miles to go do it. But we kept falling farther and far, and we come to find out what it was is that the, when Reagan got up to make the announcement, as he opened his mouth, first bomb hit. So anyway, so we're headed down there and we're looking at the, our cards and looking to time. Man, we're, getting, we're getting farther behind. And what it was, the lead sack tanker 
was responsible, the SAC was responsible for getting us to the drop off points on time and full of gas. So they were responsible for the timing getting us down there. So we're going, what? Why are we getting slow? And, you know, we're sitting there thinking, well, God, there's like 10 people on that lead airplane. And all they're doing is looking at that. Surely to God, somebody will say something. Well, apparently they didn't. So we're getting ready to make the turn in, um, into Gibraltar. And my Wizzo, God bless him, said, we're, we are 10 minutes slow, and the most we can make up is 13 minutes. you got to tell them. We're supposed to be radio out the whole time. And I went, man, no, that cannot be right. He goes, it's right. Tell them. So I got on the radio to the guy that, and we were on the lead airplane, the, the lead with the lead tanker. And I went, well, we're 10 minutes late. And we only got 12 minutes we can make up. And so he gets on tanker. And we had these half quick radios that would frequency hop. So nobody would hear us. So he calls the tanker. And about five minutes later, it just disappears. They <laughs> just cop it. And they just leave us. <laughs> and so we had to race to catch up with them. And then they're going, well, maybe we ought to cut across Tunisia here. Well, hell, we're going to do that. Why don't we do it up at you know, the French-Spanish border and save us some time, you know, if we're going to violate somebody's airspace. So we got down there, and it was just a mess. They didn't want to drop the boom because we were going too fast and this, that, and the other. But it finally got sorted out. Did they eventually then get on the radio and communicate that to you? No, they just left. All right. They just, we just calmed the power and ran off and left us. So we had to go chase them down. This was, uh, these were KC-10s? Yeah, KC-10s. And come to find out, the problem was Tactical Air Force does ground speed. Strategic Air Force does true air speed, or at least that was the explanation we were given. Well, but apparently nobody was looking at their watches up there. So You've already said you, you flew for 14 hours. It was about six hours there. Is that right? It was about, I think, six, six and a half down there. But when we lost the airplane, again, we were in the, in the group that was furthest away from the, the, the Gibraltar. So we were going to be the last ones out. So they had us hang around while they looked for Fernando's airplane. Drilled a hole in the sky for probably an extra, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Did you do an abort? Yeah. Yeah. Or the, Lord, or the radar altimeter wouldn't lock on. Right. So we couldn't TFR. Right. It's always been one of my biggest things that I've regretted is not just bugger it and hand flying it. But it was dark, right? Yeah, it's dark, but we could do it. No night vision goggles. No, I didn't need them. And you were carrying Mark Mark eighty twos. Yeah, we were carrying the the, the five hundred pounder retards with the shoots. So, but that's a long time then to be sitting thinking, you know, I might get shot at or I might get killed fairly soon. Um, you already no. talked about. No. <laughs> okay. No. So, so you're calm the whole way down. You're not getting. It's like watching. Or... I'll be honest with you. You know what? What I was thinking as we're going down there, it's like watching TV. Because you know you're sitting in a pressurized cockpit. It's air conditioned. It's comfortable. It's, it's it's like TV, man. Plus, we're finally getting to do something that we've been training for our whole life that we weren't even sure we'd ever get to do. And I'm I'm going to be honest with you. And I am the biggest idiot in the world. My wife <laughs> told me that more than once was that it never entered my mind I'd get killed. It just wasn't going to happen. You've already talked a little bit about the sort of psychology and the, the um, you know, sort of what happened to the other guy. You talked yeah. about that already. Um, how common do you think that, that your version of that is? Have you ever read, have, have you ever read a, uh, the book War for the Hell of It? Yeah, Ed Cobley. Yeah, that, God, that's one of the best books to explain to people what it's like to be a fighter pilot I've ever read in my life. You remember the part he was talking about that major that was it was scared, but he went every time and did what he was supposed to do. Uh, yeah, I was scared a lot, but that and again that was part of my problem was I was an adrenaline junkie. And you go out there and you go some, if something happens to you, you and get the living crap scared out of you. And you go, well, if this happens to me again, I'll never you know if I get out of this, I'll never do this again. And then there's nothing better feeling in life to think you're about to die and not. That's the biggest high that you'll ever have. And then you come back and a little later you go, that's kind of fun, actually. <laughs> and then you go do stuff to, to try to get that high again. And normal people don't understand that because normal people don't act that way. And I think there's a lot of guys like me 
And I think a dirty secret, dirty little secret about a lot of people in combat arms is they're in it because they like it. It's mm-hmm. you're never going to find the friendships that you find in a combat unit. You're never going to experience life like you'll experience in a combat unit. And every fighter squadron I was in, we worked hard, we played hard. And there were people that, you know, I wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire as a human being. But when we were in the air, I knew that they would take care of me and they knew I'd take care of them. And it's just not, you just don't find that in the civilian world. At what point then do you, do you know that you've got this issue and that you have to abort? As we're, as we're letting down, over, coasting in over Libya. Right. And what did, what did you then do? You, you just turned around? Turned around, dumped the bombs, went back to the tanker. You've already sort of talked about Paul and, and Fando a couple of times. So that was Karma 5 too. That was, yes. I think they were, yeah. they were the, fifth, the fifth ones to go in, weren't they? The they weren't yeah, I think they were fifth, and I think the sixth almost got whacked too. So, so what happened to them? What's, I mean, there, there wasn't a definitive answer ever, was there? There's only so no, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, it's like I said, they're sitting there going, there's one, there's one, there's one. Let's shoot. Hmm. And they got one, and I think they just barely missed another. And I, if I was a betting man, I'd say it was either Roland or Crotal the guy. Because we had jammers for all the Soviet crap. But you don't have jammers for your own stuff. But again, I don't know. I think they drowned. So they were apparently they were alive and they hit the water. No. Yeah, I think somebody, I think some of the ones that were down, that went downtown, went to the house, saw, either saw the fireball up in the air, saw fireball hit the water. Well, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but you were, you were friends with Paul, right? Oh yeah, there. I flew with him. Yeah, we, <laughs> he had a uh, Lotus, a Spree, and I had a, an MG. And when we would drive to work, I lived up in uh, Stanton, Paul Gray Hall in Stanton. And he lived out in a village uh, west of Munford. So we'd drive to work in the morning. We'd meet at the Munford roundabout, and we'd race to work. He, he must have beaten you. No, because the, the, the thing about great. it was the roads were so curvy, he could never get top end. <laughs> and my, my MG would turn, would handle just as well as his Lotus did. Now, if we'd been on straight stretch, he'd just blow me away. But the roads were so curvy, he never could hit top end on it. So, so, so returning from the UK, from from Louis back to the UK, what was the mood like? Because uh, you, you, everybody must have known that there was an airplane missing. Again, it's something that, that civilians don't understand is we die all the time. I mean, I I don't think I went a year. I was in the Air Force fourteen years, and I don't think I went a year without somebody dying that I personally knew. I mean, we put seven in the ground in one year at Lake and Heath. Really? Yeah. So actually, we thought, you know, it wasn't cheap for Paul or, or Fernando, but, you know, actually, we got off pretty pretty good on that raid, mm-hmm. just losing one. Mm-hmm. And one's too many by far, but uh, it's it's part of the game. It's, uh, people People die. Did you have uh, much of a search and rescue plan? And I mean, you, you joked about the capsule being difficult to bury. The Navy, Navy was going to go in. I think the Navy had submarines to go in. And then they had like their boats that would go in to get them or, or helicopters. Or, but Navy's out there. If if, in fact, if any of those any patrol boats come out from the Libyan coast, they were going to the bottom. You mentioned, you mentioned jamming uh, pods. One thing I'd also read, it's just jogged my memory, is that Apparently, when you guys landed and you sort of downloaded those pods and took them to maintenance, or whatever, and they opened them up, bits of them have fallen off. Oh yeah, we fried shit out of them. Well, they're, well, they're designed for you know two, three hour missions, not fourteen hour ones. So, plus, I think these, I think these pods that we had, I think this may have been the first time they've been tested like real combat. Plus, they're way the hell up there, cold soaking for hours. Then you take them down. And they, then you're using them and they get hot and then you take them back up, you know, and they freeze on the way back. So, yeah, I don't think they're designed for that. I did hear from somebody years ago, and this is just an interesting, maybe an interesting anecdote, if not something you, you could comment or, or would give any credence to. Um, but it was a lady, she contacted me and she said that she had been a tech sergeant in the Intel side of the the raid. I don't know, um, you know exactly the, the full details, but she was mm-hmm. she was in the 48th fighter wing in the intel section or whatever, and she said to me 
the night before the raid, the Soviet advisors who typically worked in some of those sites in, in Libya all got in a bus, traveled to the coast and got picked up by a submarine. Yeah, it's my understanding that they're, they, they weren't anybody around that had a red star. So there, there was perhaps some forewarning to, to, some, to yeah. some people. So when you get back then, um, one of the things that I find very curious about this whole thing is the level of um, sort of shunning publicity around it. Um, even today, it seems like some a lot of people just don't want to acknowledge they were part of it, don't want to be interviewed, don't want to talk about it. Well, why is that? I think they were afraid that uh, they'd come after us. But... Then again, I was talking, I, one of the houses I rented was from uh, a British Army General, David Thorne. He'd been the commander of some some of the forces in Northern Ireland and also the British Army of the Rhine. He said, you guys got nothing to, to worry about. The only people that can get to you in the UK is the IRA, and they get way too much money from you. <laughs> so they're not coming after you. Well, yeah. Okay. It's, it's very circular, that relationship, isn't it? Yeah. You've, you've picked up on a number of different things that you thought were, were crazy. How, how would you have done the raid then if it, if it had been you planning it? I would let the individual crews plan their attacks. I would have, what the caveat is that you've got to come from different directions. And you can do that. I mean, you can time and distance it out. And we did it all the time. That's all we did. And we could have hit, you know, all six airplanes could have dropped their bombs all at the same time, coming from different directions, and they wouldn't have had a clue you were there until those bombs started going off. And then they are off back home and you're done. If I'd been in charge of it, I'd bomb, bomb the oil field. And not defended. They really hurt him. Of course, it hurt, you know, the oil companies too, but that's where I would have hit. What did you think of the leadership then at Lake Anise? Well, my, my squadron commander, or the, the squadron, I, I was in stand about standardization evaluation with Paul and Fernando. So we were like staff guys, but we were attached to squadrons for flying and killing and stuff. Uh, and I was attached to the 494th and Paul was actually was commander of him. He's great. He's a great guy. Uh, Colonel Westbrook's one of the best commanders I ever had as a wing commander. I have no complaints about him at all. Hmm. Um, Venk, was Venkus the vice wing? He's vice wing. I mean, we really didn't mess with him too much. I mean, he was more, he did what Sam told him to do. I, I just, I, I suppose I just wonder, you know, having been quite upfront about the way in which it was planned and your thoughts about it, I, I wonder what. Well, it was, you know, it was the only war we had, and we hadn't had one in a long time. I think everybody wanted to get their hand in it, you know, higher up the food chain. And I think you had people making decisions that, you know, micromanaging stuff they had no business micromanaging that's what they had us for i mean we're perfectly capable of planning a mission like this we do it all the time and you don't know us you don't know the airplane you don't know the capabilities you don't know you know this you know every airplane has its own culture and how it does things and and after a while you you learn like flying an f4 ground attack mission was completely different than flying an f-111 ground attack mission it it, it just was and like having a guy that's, you know, a, a staff general who probably gets in an airplane once a month, maybe if he's lucky, that's not a transport, determining your tactics for a tactical fighter mission, it, it's nuts. Our leaders fought it, but they were basically told, piss off and, you know, dude, go do what you're told. And we went, well, we ain't, we're not giving it back, so, all right, we'll go do it. Is there anything else you'd say about the raid? Is there anything that you've thought about in the intervening years that, that is noteworthy? I like Lehman. Lehman? Say, okay, and again, this I may have the details wrong on this, but the way I understand it was that after the raid was they put us in for a presidential unit citation. And some empty suit up in the Pentagon, again, you know, had, had his butt burned from Grenada and, and Panama went, Okay, you can do that, but only the people who actually went on the raid can wear it. And our commanders, and rightly so, I think, said, no, piss off. We all get it, or we don't want it. So these guys, you know, worked on the planes. They loaded the bombs. They're just as part of, much part of this mission as we are. They don't get it. We don't want it. And we wouldn't have worn them if they assigned it to just us. So Lehman, 
uh, a couple of weeks or a couple of months later, comes out to the med to go talk to the guys on the boat. And on his way back, he just happened to, to drop in the lake in Heath. And somehow somebody told him about, you know, that happening. He goes, yes, yes. Yeah. So he awards the uh, wing, the Navy Marine Corps Meritorious his unit citation. And you can't get both. You, can't, you only get one. So that completely stopped the Air Force from awarding us anything. But everybody got that. And we're the only unit in the Air Force that has that award. When I got back, I ended up being uh, Paul's mortuary affairs officer, which is, is like being an administrator of an estate, except on the military side. He basically, and I'll tell you what, I, I, I didn't have to do anything. I've never seen a guy had his guts in line so much as he did. I mean, he had everything lined up. Basically, all I had to do is, you know, go through his files and call people. It was done, you know, like the life insurance people and dealing with the Air Force for his wife and his kid and, and you know, getting them back to the States and that kind of stuff. So, What other missions were you prepped for then that you didn't execute? You mentioned, you know, Lebanon. Um, what, some, what some, I don't know what we were going to hit down in Lebanon. They never told us. We never got that far. They just, we flew down there. They put the planes in, in the TAD Vs and we hid and they wouldn't let us go off base because we weren't supposed to be there. Was this Inchilek? Yeah, the Lick. Okay. Yeah, the Lick. So what was the the highlight of your career that I'm just interested to know? The, the one thing that you look back on and think that was... That. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. It just... Well, it the first, like, thing, first thing that happened when we first got over there was the Falklands. Yeah. When I first got there was when the Falklands kicked off. And we were living in Thetford. And I woke up one Saturday morning. There's tanks going by our house, going to the Stanford PTA, the Army training area up there in Norfolk. So, you know, tank column going by. I go, whoa. And then we... Uh, help. We flew against the Royal Navy while they were ginning up to go down there. You know, did it attack them? And uh, ugh. I tell you, if if that war did nothing else, it proved the worth of big carriers. Yeah. Because I've I've attacked U.S. carrier task forces, and I never got within 100 miles of them. And we got on the on the Brits both times. Now, they, they would have gotten some of us, but we were pulling off our bomb rounds when we first got locked on. I've, I've written a bit about the Red Eagles and, and um, the aggressors. And, and one of the things that seems to be the case is you talk to a lot of people and they say, well, I never really thought about the threat. I thought, no, I thought the mouth breathing knuckle dragon Russia hadn't been made that could beat me. So, and like I say, I flew against, we flew against MIGs and we flew against the aggressors. I think the smartest thing, and, it, and I'm still amazed that they still do it, the Air Force ever did was start red flag. Just if for nothing else, do you see just a, what a massive coat rope it, these big packages can be and how things just fall apart and how you have to make decisions and adjustments on the run. And it's the best training there is. We lose people all the time. And usually in the Air Force, that, the peacetime Air Force, that's a kiss of death for a commander. But they have decided to accept that loss or the gain that you get from it. And it's one of the smartest things they've ever done.